Okay, so here we are now. Yeah, hi Scott, hi again. It's great to see you. Uh, so uh, since you know we don't have too much time, maybe my first question would be about uh, uh, you know the story of uh, you getting to Brief Family Therapy Center and working with uh, Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg as a part of their team. Can you? Please tell how it was. Sure. In the early 1980s, I was a doctoral student in Utah, and I met a psychologist whose name is Lynn Johnson. And Lynn had a mirror in his office and invited me as a graduate student. And I was really starving for somebody to give me direction about how to do psychotherapy. I had lots of basic courses in grad school and I knew how to listen and reflect feelings and give sundry psychological tests, but I didn't really understand how this therapy thing was supposed to work. Lynn offered to let me sit behind his mirror and watch him work and he'd been influenced to a large degree by MRI, the people at MRI, in particular John Weakland, who came regularly to visit Lynn in Salt Lake when he was out and about and doing workshops. And then occasionally in Sue Berg would be in town. And it was really through Lynn that I learned about uh, the solution focused work, although it really wasn't called that at that particular time. We're talking about uh, the period of uh, keys, the blue book. And we read that book together. We read the focused solution development article, which was a reaction to the focused problem resolution article that appeared in family process and was written by the MRI team. It was a very heady time, but what I most appreciated about it was not only to see Lynn in action doing things with people and using the ideas, but also the clarity with which they spoke. Here's what you could say, here's what you could do, here's how you began the visit, Here, are, here's how you ended the visit. And I started writing a paper uh, that eventually ended up being called The Symptoms of Solution. And it was kind of a tongue in cheek piece that appeared in JST. And it was during that time that uh, I wrote to Insu and asked her to read it and give me some feedback. And uh, she said that she was going to be in Denver doing a workshop. And if I could make it there, that I could come for free, which is the right price for a grad student. I had no money. Yeah. So I drove my beat up old car down to, to, over to Denver from Salt Lake. And I stayed with Yvonne Dolan and Charlie Johnson, who were together at the time. And I met Insu and I attended her workshop in alcohol and drug treatment. And it just so happened that I was at that time working in a drug and alcohol treatment facility just north of Salt Lake City. We had a marvelous discussion. I was fairly discouraged about the work that we were doing with people who struggled with drug and alcohol issues. It was mostly the Johnsonian approach and the 12 steps. And it seemed to leave a lot of clients in the lurch. They just didn't get much out of it. Insu was interested in the paper. In any event, I met and we corresponded for some time. And uh, I finished my work and I went to do a residency in the state of California where I grew up. And I was about to finish there when I sent a note to Insu saying that I was going to Omaha to work with Bill O'Hanlon and his then partner, uh, Patricia Hudson. And uh, she wrote me a letter back. Actually, I got it when I came back from Omaha and had spent some time with Bill and, and Pat and said, well, before you accept that job, why don't you come out to Milwaukee? Um, and so I did. I, I Again, uh, although I didn't have much money, I scraped up enough funds to fly out there. I stayed in Insu and Steve's house, and I spent a week there behind the mirror watching cases and watching them work and talking. And as soon as I was there, I knew that that's where I wanted to be. Uh, the place was on fire. Uh, the energy was electric. They were working with 
people that really needed help, not the walking wounded. And they were also vibrant in their thinking. And there were lots of other professionals that were coming in and out in the community and nationally that were interested in what was being done. And so as soon as I finished up my residency, uh, I, uh, INSU offered me a position and I moved uh, to, to Milwaukee and began working. And that would have been in the midsummer of 1988. Mm-hmm. And so that's 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 how I got there, anyway. And you worked there for several years, I think, and you wrote uh, well one book with Insu and uh, some books by yourself, I think. I did a book that I was working on at the time when I was doing my residency on alcohol and drug treatment. And INSU, of course, had some interest in that. Many of the people that were being seen at brief at that particular time had drug and alcohol problems in addition to other other concerns. Uh, and so we uh, wrote that book and published it in, I believe it came out in 1992, but it was really being written during that entire period back and forth. And just after I left, I published another book that Insu's name is on called uh, The Miracle Method, which was an attempt to write a self-help book, really, using solution-focused ideas and put them into a format that would appeal to regular folk. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then we wrote a series of, of papers and such that uh, during the, that particular time. Okay. So I, I want to cite uh, your one of your uh, papers uh, and you said that forget what you know or have come to believe about solution focused therapy the mechanical version that exists today bears precious little resemblance to the work being done at the time i joined the staff Uh, the process at bftc was fluid and dynamic and atmosphere positively electric so can you tell a little bit uh, what were your first impressions uh, with the way the team worked at that time? I mean, uh, was it uh, surprising to you? The I think that- what, what was mostly surprising to me, having come from Palm Springs and working at the Patty Duke Center for Depression, was the atmosphere there, or the, I, I would say rather the building and the facilities were really abysmal. It was a poor clinic there. The chairs were old, the video equipment dilapidated, but, uh, and and yet there was this energy that was at the place. Uh, One of the first days I arrived on my very first visit, I I came through the reception area. I said, hey, I'm Scott. And she said, just a minute, I'll go get in. So Insu came and got me. I, I walked down the hall. This was at the bottom floor when the clinic was still at the bottom floor at 6815 West Capitol. And I turned the corner and Steve was coming out of his office. Uh, and Insu introduced me. Steve said, mm. uh, and I said, uh, nice to meet you. And he said, I'm writing a paper. Why don't you read it and get back to me with feedback? And it was that kind of atmosphere. Here I am somebody that he really doesn't know uh, and he was interested in what I might say and I took that charge seriously. I went home and I made comments on the paper. Uh, the Two days later Steve was back and many of the things that I had commented on, I'll be the minor, they they were incorporated into the paper. That was the atmosphere at the at the clinic at that particular time and we were truly interested, I think, and I and I think that's what carried me through my time there in figuring out how to help people more efficiently and how to be able to teach others to do this in an efficient way as, as well. Hmm. As soon as we, uh, of course, an agency is a, is, is, a, is a diverse entity, so there are many goals, and one of the goals was to stay afloat. And at the time that I joined, two other younger people, Larry Hopwood and Jane Kashnick, joined at that, at that same time. And uh, the, the clinic was in trouble. It didn't really have any clients uh, per se. And so I think this young blood really infused uh, a bit of organization into, in, into the clinic. Um, uh, so 
it, it, for me, for me at least, uh, being there and uh, having Steve and uh, work the way he did, having Insu work the way they did, how on fire they were, that was that was that was exciting. Hmm. Well, but it seems that uh, the the relationship were really democratic. I mean, a, a horizontal one, not not too much of hierarchy or you know like them being the big mentors since they were interested in your ideas yeah and this is the second part of my my comment that that when we began to interact with people coming from around the from from around the world and we had to teach there had to be a way to standardize and formalize what we what we were saying then the minute that was done then suddenly it became a way of doing it and yeah. They, and oftentimes there was a great deal of exasperation if things were changed or modified or we didn't seem to follow the rules. So the very complaint that I had going there uh, evaporated because we were so interested in experimenting and trying things out. But I saw that same concern expressed by the people who came to be trained. Just, just tell us how to do it, step one, two, and three. And it became that, ask the miracle question, ask exception questions, scale, give a compliment, give the formula first session task. And, and that, was, that, that, that was solution focus. But for me, being there every day and seeing Insu and Steve work, perhaps Insu more than Steve, it never really followed the rules that clearly. And the rules were simply there to see what kind of reaction would we get? And they had to be standard so we could know yeah. was what we we're seeing a reliable uh, outcome of what we were doing. And then we could change what we were doing the next time. So, but it was never, at least while I was there, it was never uh, a part of the commentary that we discovered the right steps to follow. And if you did it, uh, the, the solution would, would emerge. We were, we were always experimenting. Mm. Okay. So, uh, can you tell us what uh, what was the uh, how this work? I mean, the, the work that is called now a day solution focused. Uh, how it influenced your practice to to these days? I mean, to, to, to till today, what, what is the influence? How it influenced your practice, your research, maybe way you see things in the therapy world. I find that a hard question to answer, question answer, answer and it. I'll tell you why. I, for, for me, at least, I, I don't I, do I anything that is remotely solution. I'm starting to hear an echo. Yeah. So I'm not sure what's sure happening. What's happening it's coming on your end. Uh, actually, it's the sound is okay for me. Yeah, but I can hear it, and it's... Okay, all right. Um, where was I? Um, I? I would say that I I do very little that most people would point at and say is solution focused nowadays. And when people ask me about it, I say it was a great childhood as a therapist. I had everything I needed to grow. And what did I need? I needed some supportive people. I needed a, a dogged interest in following the leads wherever they led, playful experimentation. And that's exactly what I got, a curiosity at, at brief. What else could we do? Never being satisfied, never settling, pushing the envelope. That's, that's carried me through uh, my, my entire career. But the ideas at that particular time, I, you know, I, I don't think that, uh, I, I, don't, I don't find other than uh, the same way anyone's childhood affects them, I don't, I don't find them operating in my, in my present work in any obvious fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, could you also tell us how the follow-up uh, was was done at the time at BFTC? I mean, I think all the clients were followed up, and uh, also maybe it has to do with the research that was done at that time, research about the effectiveness. No, the, the clients weren't all followed up. There were a couple of studies that were done, uh, one early on, uh, by Steve using the same questions that the MRI group had used. And then uh, two other studies that were done while I was there, um, uh, one by Linda Metcalf at Texans Women University and one by Peter DeJong at Calvin College. 
that had followed up on a random assortment of clients and Linda did more in-depth interviews and Peter asked more outcome oriented style questions. But there wasn't any attempt to follow up on clients on a, uh, on a one-to-one basis, really. Uh, we were, and we did, watch each other's work. Towards the end of my tenure there, there was much less of that because all of us were traveling, uh, with the exception of Larry, uh, pretty much all the time. But in the beginning, those first three and a half years, we dutifully showed up at seven in the morning. And most nights, I would say, including Saturdays, we were there till six or seven at night and we would watch hour after hour. And then there'd be discussion about the cases, what we had seen, how that fit, what our thinking was at the time, what we needed to alter or change, or if we needed to alter or change anything. Um, So uh, like I say, that was the, that was the, I think something that I've, I, for me, at least I've, I've really retained this I, this idea of wanting to push the envelope, continue thinking, not settle or be satisfied with the work uh, wherever it is at that time. There's always something more we could do and do better. Hmm. Okay. So, but uh, in this article that I was citing, you said about the, the research that it was like a big, a major blow to your confidence because the research uh, showed that, uh, well, maybe <laughs> you tell it. <laughs> well, what, you know, what, at, what? At, at that time and here again, I think that this was something that initially was, was very welcomed by the team, this kind of inquiry. I wrote a paper called, Where's the Beef? Uh, And in that paper, I was already having concerns. I expressed my concerns about the reification of solution-focused therapy around a certain set of skills uh, or or techniques rather than a process of of inquiry uh, based on curiosity. And uh, we, the, the researchers came back and essentially what they said, or at least the parts that struck me the most was that we were effective, but that we were no more effective than anybody else. Now, they hadn't done a comparative analysis, but the data that Peter DeJong came back with showed that we were no more effective than any other treatment approach that I knew of. And as a psychologist, I'd spent the early part of my graduate career studying outcome research, so I knew a a fair bit about it. And it just wasn't that difference. We had no more single session cures. We weren't any briefer than anybody else. And so the real question became, well, what is it that's unique about solution focused? And I didn't want to simply learn another language that was the same as every other therapeutic language. I wanted to understand the effective ingredients so that I could wield them more effectively in the service of clients. And that was very disruptive. It was very disruptive. In addition, uh, Linda Metcalf's research essentially indicated that the only time clients seem to remember any of the techniques that we'd spent so much time talking about was when the the care that we provided wasn't helpful. Well, that's sort of the opposite. In other words, when therapy is helpful, it's generally seamless. People can't tell that you're doing this or that to them, really. Instead, they, they experience themselves as getting better along the way. And ultimately, uh, although not exclusively, that that eventually led to the uh, the disbanding of of the team. Mm. So, but what was the reaction of the of the uh, founders? I mean, Steve and Inso. But what was their reaction to this research? Were they confused in in some way? Well, again, my if you read the book Words by Steve which is my favorite of his books, uh, we were having this discussion, the quote that's in there that starts off the book by Freud. Now, you know, I spent my, again, part of my graduate career in psychoanalysis with a Winnicott trained analyst. And uh, so that reference was something I was talking about in the meetings and Steve uh, took that reference and we talked about it a great deal. And, uh, he, in, in part, it, I think it provided some direction for the words book, but at the end of that book, and my more important point is that uh, he says, he looks back and it's the epilogue, and to me, it's the best thing he ever wrote. He said that we had perhaps become too enamored of our techniques and our clever strategies. And that was the direction we were all going when eventually the team disbanded in the summer of 93. Um, but but my, my sense is that had the team continued, we would have moved beyond that 
uh, and and tried to and perhaps even moved in the direction that that our, our team has gone, uh, my present team has gone, with more of an emphasis on using whatever approach you want, measuring the outcomes, and then working at your errors, your your particular specific errors. But uh, at the time, I I, I think that, uh, for example, the character in the paper, um, and I can't remember what I call him, beef throat or something like that, playing on the, the idea of deep throat, that that character was based on Steve. Steve constantly advising me to uh, question my assumptions, to not take these things for granted, to not get too convinced that we had the techniques all figured out. Um, and lost the humanity and the curiosity of the work. Okay, so I have two more questions about the work at the BFTC. Uh, first one is, it seems to me, maybe my impression is wrong, that uh, the work being done there was in the 90s more popular in Europe than in the United States. Is it true? Yes. How come? Why? Yeah, um, I think that there are a couple of real simple reasons. First off, Steve and Insu weren't academics. And uh, academics lend support and get grant funding. Uh, another thing that I took away from my time at BFTC is that BFTC funded all of this research out of its own pocket. And that's a tradition we've continued. I'm not associated with a university, at least not one that pays me. And we fund all of our research on our own. So I don't have graduate students who do all the uh, labor for uh, for me or our team. We we do it ourselves. We share that expense. Um, so I think that's one thing. They weren't academic. Secondly, I think Steve's turn to the postmodern came at a time when it came at a very unfortunate time in the United States. The United States was trending towards evidence based practice, uh, defined as models that have been tested in randomized clinical trials. And we, I think at that particular time, had a, an allergy to specifying that first you do this and then you do that and then you do this. Uh, and then Steve's feelings about research and uh, such prevented that from happening and it really cost solution focused a position. Now, thankfully, people that have followed have, have done more of that legwork and, and uh, solution focus is now, in some instances, approved as an evidence-based practice. Uh, but I think I think that's perhaps the main reason. There was more tolerance in Europe for models of therapy than there was in the United States if they'd not been tested. Hmm, okay. So uh, you wrote that uh, the most effective members of the team were not Steve and Insu. <laughs> I don't think I said that. I said I think I said that it wasn't the senior <laughs> staff. Uh, it it was sorry. It wasn't the senior staff weren't the most yeah, effective. I don't yeah. think I ever named names. Ah, okay. So it wasn't the senior staff. But mm. uh, was it a surprise for for you and for other team members when it was? I mean, at that time, uh, the research showed that uh, experience is not uh, the main factor. Um, it was like uh, it. Well, it was a surprise, but at least for me, it was a it was a pleasant surprise. It confirmed the data that suggested that experience really didn't matter. It fit with the data suggesting that the model really wasn't where expertise was located, and um, uh, it, it was uh, yeah. So I, I it it was a surprise, but but a good one, and for me. That's part of, of and the hope of being a researcher, not to find what you hope, but to discover something you weren't planning on and see where it see where it takes you. And so discovering that having this very specific method didn't lead to better outcomes, I guess in some ways that's discouraging. For me, it was invigorating to find out that the student had better outcomes than the masters, supposedly. Uh, that 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 again created curiosity. Well, what is it that she's doing? How come she is more effective than the rest of us? And instead of looking for an excuse like, well, she's here more often or she's more curious because she doesn't know what she's doing, uh, I, I, 
what I, what I think was called for was really looking closely at those practitioners who seem to have superior outcomes regardless of their training or experience. Mm. Okay. So uh, maybe, yeah, maybe I would also, uh, we don't have too much time, you know, talking about the feedback informed treatment, but maybe you could somehow summarize very briefly how you move to this uh, understanding of uh, therapy. I don't think it's a model. I, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that you don't want a, this to be another model, actually. Right. Right. Well, that's always been the dilemma. Uh, initially, like I think many, or I hope many, I don't think I'm too alone in this, I wanted somebody to tell me how to do the work. And the reason is I believe that if I did it the right way, similar to driving a car or doing brain surgery, then it should result in better outcomes. Well, it turns out, despite our attempt and a very concerted effort, and not just by our team, but by many teams around the world to figure out which model is best, that that's failed. It's failed miserably. All of the approaches intended to be therapeutic work about equally well. Uh, even if you grant what some claim are the differences, CBT for anxiety, even if you grant that, and I won't grant that, and we have a new article out that is one of uh, is uh, from psychotherapy research called In Pursuit of Truth, uh, we reanalyze this data and, and show that there's not much. But even if there were a difference, the differences reported are so minuscule that they're not important. Certainly, they don't justify spending thousands of dollars to learn them. So if that's not what's accounting for effective therapy, which was driving me, then maybe it was something else. And our initial work after brief was in common factors. We thought, well, all the models must work because of the factors that they share, a good relationship, um, installation of hope and expectation, model and structure, ritual, tapping into client strengths and resources, et cetera. And we mined that vein for some time, but it turned out that teaching people the common factors, the logic of this made no sense. Why would teaching people the common factors make them more effective if teaching them the models based on the common factors aren't any more effective? We gave up, we started measuring our outcomes. We said, maybe we can't figure out how therapy is done. Clearly it works virtually any way uh, the therapists do this works, but we could find out if it's working for the individual. So we measure our outcomes. As soon as we start measuring our outcomes, we find out two things. Number one, if we feed back this information to the clinicians on an ongoing basis, hey, you're helping person A, but not person B, clinicians did a bang up job saying, I better pay more attention to person B then. And when they did, their outcomes improved. Perfect. The second finding we, we, we had was that certain therapists were more effective than others in general. And this took us back to the puzzle with the graduate student who was more effective than the master therapist at the agency and right back to square one with my question, well, what are they doing? You know, and how can I learn that? And so in addition to suggesting that therapists monitor and measure their outcomes, we've been now investigating, well, why are some more effective than others? And it turns out that the best clinicians spend more time identifying the errors that they make and practicing to improve. It's that simple, not easy, but it's exactly that simple. And the best therapists spend on average between two and a half and four times as much time devoted to that process, looking for those small errors, those missteps in therapy with individual clients, seeking consultation and coaching and support, and then practicing those skills so that they can hopefully improve. Uh, when when you say about uh, improving skills and that effective practitioners do this on a regular basis, does that mean that uh, they have this idea that ah I I'm bad at giving I don't know uh, asking a miracle question or or just uh, I don't know saying hello to the client I'm bad at that, and then they start practicing this, or does it mean that they see that there is some failure with the concrete client, with a particular client, and I need to repair something with him, because that's the major difference. 
Yeah, and these are these are both great questions and exactly the right question to ask. Well, what is it that what is it that we're supposed to practice? How do how do we how do we know? And so there are two things. First, when you measure your outcomes, you begin to generate a huge amount of data that you can look at to see are there problems in that data. So let me give you a couple. One area that in in individual practitioners practices that is often problematic is their retention rate, meaning that many clinicians have a 15 to 30% dropout after the first, third, or fifth visit. And the clinicians in a solution-focused way might say, well, the client got what they needed. Well, not so fast. Some of them got what they needed, probably half, and the other half didn't. And that's where our interest is. So when you gather data, you can start to identify problems in your performance that occur across clients. If, however, your data is very clean, you know, your dropout rate is at benchmark level, your average number of sessions is at benchmark, then we have to look someplace else. And here, the common factors are can operate as a guide. What are the elements in a, any given therapy that contribute to outcome? in order there, relationship, hope and expectancy, structure and model, in that order. And so generally we say, if you're struggling with a client, that probably the chief problem is some relational deficit, meaning that in forming a working relationship, there's something missing for that individual client. So the first approach gives us a global look at your data. The next one looks at your work with that individual client through the lens of the common factors. Sometimes the problem doesn't lie in your ability to establish a work in alliance. Sometimes it falls in the area of failing to create hope and expectation for change with that individual client. And last but not least, some therapists, they lack structure, focus, and ritual. Their therapy kind of goes in all different directions, not with all their clients, but with that one client. For some reason, they, they get outside their usual way of working. And so here we can identify opportunities for the therapist to get some consulting, uh, consultation rather, and coaching around how they might better work with that individual client. And then in the process and over time, a long time, extend their outcomes. Okay. So uh, what is interesting, I mean, you were doing training uh, for a long time now you train therapists all over the world. And uh, I'm really interested in how how it changed over time. I mean, after the work at BFTC and now, I mean, this common factors thing and uh, feedback thing and um, uh, excellence thing, I mean, it changed your style and your the, the work that you do when you train, teach people. How, how it's done now? Nowadays, how is uh, how do you train people? I mean, what what are the main uh, things that you focus on? What are the main skills, or what is the framework uh, that you try to create in order to uh, to help people to get better? Well, I I view my the work that I do in terms of training in two different ways. The first is introduction and inspiration. And if I'm coming in to do a one-day workshop, you can no more learn a way of thinking or working in a single day than you could learn to speak Russian. You, 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 you can't even speak good, uh, simple expressions in Russian after a day. Uh, so for, for me, and when I'm out and doing these introductory days, I'm thinking about, can I entice and spot, inspire people to read a little bit more, to think a little bit more? And if I do that, then I then I feel like I'm successful. The to think of those workshops, however, as a form of continuing education is not supported by any of the evidence whatsoever. Training requires something quite different. So then there's the second part of the work that we do, which is a much more in-depth, individually oriented training where we help and support therapists who are learning to track their outcomes using standardized tools, identify their unique and specific errors. So let me just stop here and say, if you go to a workshop and to learn something new, the chances are 50-50, it will either make you better or worse. Most of us go to this thinking it will of course make me better. 
No, there's no guarantee of that. So in order to get better, you have to think about what do I need to know so that I am improving my work with my clients. And generic prescriptions from some decontextualized teacher aren't going to help you whatsoever in that process. So the first thing we need to do is help the therapist gather their data so that we can see, are there large and glaring holes? If there aren't any, then how can we help them attend to the individual client better? And we have a something called the taxonomy of deliberate practice, which helps therapists set first identify clinician specific errors. What are my errors? Because of course, my ability to connect with certain clients is going to be different than yours. That's not a bad thing. That's the beauty of the work. However, if I want to see the client that you see and are successful with, and I'm not, well, I'm going to have to learn something new that fits my style. So we have this taxonomy of deliberate practice that helps you identify those clinician or individual uh, errors and then develop a plan for remediation, taking some small steps. I think the challenge in this work is that progress is a lot like progress among Olympic athletes. Most therapists are effective. The effort it takes to become more effective than you already are is significantly greater than the effort it took you to get how effective you are now. It's again, like an Olympic athlete getting in shape Oh my gosh, that takes a lot of effort. But improving once you're in shape, that takes time, dedication, a strong will, coaching, and uh, persistence, really. And that's what we're talking about, helping clinicians that are really good at what they do push their performance a little bit at a time. Uh, so sometimes, you know, uh, your work is understood by... Uh, by other professionals as the sim the simplistic understanding, uh, and I guess it's the wrong understanding that techniques do not matter. Don't uh, train or teach techniques. That that's what some people get out from your workshops, from your lectures, from your papers. Mm. So uh, I guess it's the wrong, or maybe a simplistic understanding. Yeah, so, well, it's it's so completely wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, here's, here's, if you go to learn music, chances are the teacher is going to have you do scales. Da, na, 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 na. Why do you do that? You do that so you have the ground understanding and an ability to vary from a known standard. But anybody who claims that a scale is music is nuts. So you, of course, need some kind of technique or strategy, some approach, some way of thinking. However, to think that that's therapy, that's, that's nuts. It's a scale. Uh, it's a way of thinking about things. And you're going to have to take that and vary it. Once you've mastered those scales, you have to vary it to create music with your individual clients. Uh I'm sorry. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll ask the que the similar questions, but because it's uh, it's another logic, it's uh, maybe not so. Uh, um, so we need to articulate that a little bit more. So another uh, strategy that I think most of the clinicians in the real practice world uh, do is, uh, you know, adding. I go to the CBT workshop. I go to the solution focus workshop. I go to the EFT workshop and there's a work on trauma or something else. Oh, that's just, you know, adding the stuff to their, to their baggage. Is it, what would you think is this strategy? Is it uh, pointless from your point of view or, or what, what would you say to that? Largely pointless. And the way to, the way to do this, it, the way to see if it makes any difference for you, if you don't believe me, and I'm not saying you, but if the listener doesn't believe me, well, then start measuring your outcomes and then go to a workshop and see if your outcomes improve. I promise you they won't. Because clinician outcomes don't improve over time, they get worse. So, you know, I, I just think this is a waste of money in the same way that um, thinking that if I copy the, the backhand of a championship tennis player, I will become a championship tennis player. It's the same silly idea. 
the way a championship tennis player becomes a champion is by practicing and developing a style that fits and works for them. But copycats, they take this, they reify it, copy it, and then think that if they do it exactly the same, well, clearly that doesn't work or everybody would be able to play the same level of tennis as Federer. So if uh, going into one approach and, you know, just what this is the, the other strategy, clinicians, you know, some, some of them, they try to get better, you know, the way you can ask the super miracle question, you know, the right way with the right uh, expression in your eyes. And then mm. the client will give uh, the answer that will help him. So that's the other strategy, but it's also useless. I mean, so adding is not so it doesn't improve your effectiveness or right. going deeper inside you know going into like super small details is also uh, not gonna make you any better you could play a scale slowly or with feeling it's still a scale it's not music and in addition i guess a better way to say this is that when you're trying to examine your performance and see how to improve and what i take away from your both of your questions is the strong desire, it's the same desire I share, to get better. So I'm not upset, or I wouldn't be upset with clinicians. I'm upset with the teachers of clinicians who continue to sell things that really don't work. And that's because of this idea that psychotherapy is like medicine. Give a better pill, you'll get a better outcome. It doesn't quite work that way. The therapist is the most effective ingredient in the therapeutic process. That means that they have to improve. In order to improve, they have to find out their errors. So it's a huge leap in logic to say, well, if the miracle question didn't work, then I should ask the super miracle question with the emphasis in the right areas, especially if the problem is that this client is not inspired or feel hopeful when you do it. And perhaps what would lend engender hope on the part of this client is more careful listening in the beginning. I don't know. We'd have to watch the video. We'd have to uh, then look at the taxonomy and highlight those clinician specific errors. Now, at the same time, you may have a clinician who has no structure in their approach and teaching them the miracle question or just a goal question, you know, what do you hope for? What are your best hopes for? I think they're talking about now in solution focus work. This is a great way to add structure. However, if your client doesn't want to talk about their life in that way, adding that kind of structure may again defeat hope. So I, I think you need a scale, you need a general strategy, you need to try it out, notice your errors where it doesn't fit that individual client and then figure out what to do differently. Okay. So your advice for practitioners, for clinicians, number one is measure your outcomes to know what, what's going wrong. What are you yes. doing? What, what are you bad at? Yes. And it doesn't that sound awful? And who wants to do that? I'll tell you who wants to do it. The most effective therapists. Over and over and over again, the effective therapists say, I'm not so good at this. You know, I really have to struggle at it. Um, I wish I were better. And, oh, I remember this case. And they think after their session, oh, I wish I would have said this. Those are the super effective therapists. The, the moderately effective therapists say, I know what I'm doing. I do this and that and the other thing. And, boy, I have it all figured out. They're never surprised or rarely surprised. So, and I'm not talking about false humility here. I'm not talking about saying, oh, what do I know, really? You know, I don't know anything. I'm a postmortem person. You know, oh, bullshit. Therapists know a lot. It's really about feeling in your being. I need to look for when it doesn't work and then see what I can do about that as opposed to using the same process over and over again, which I think clinicians want to do, by the way. And I think they're naturally inclined to do that. But the teachers and supervisors push them away from that very practice. Okay, what else? What would you advise to the clinicians that want to get better or want to work better besides tracking outcomes and knowing what they are doing wrong? Sit down and create a deep, thick description of how they work. And the way to do that is to keep detailed notes after sessions. 
about what you said and what you did and when you did it. And gather this information over a period of time so you can get a true and honest picture, not through retrospection, oh, how do I work? But by looking at the actual details, the log of your work and seeing where you went. I think most clinicians will find that it's a bit more complex and that the theory that they say guides their work has lots of caveats. You know, oh, I did this, but not when that happened. Oh, it was a Tuesday, so I didn't do that. It, a lot of it doesn't make sense. So develop a thick description, measure their outcomes, develop a thick description of, of their work. Third thing is to look for the big problems first. And the big problems are dropout, lack of progress, and deterioration. Those are the three big ones. Dropout is number one. Huge numbers of clients don't come back. Don't fool yourself into saying, oh, it's okay because they got what they wanted. Because even among the people who said, oh yeah, if you call them up and you say, "How did you, know, did you get what you wanted, you didn't come back, half of them say, I got what I wanted. Now that sounds good, but to me what I hear is half didn't. And how come I missed it? Uh, so the, 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 uh, the second one is look for clients who don't make progress. Up to a third of people on clinicians' caseloads are making no progress, but they continue to come. What could you do to potentiate that? And the last one is look at your deterioration rates. Why do some people, why are some people getting worse and what can I do about that? Those are the big problems to address. If none of those problems are present, then we've got to start looking at process errors, small process errors with individual clients. And um, the, the way to do that uh, is something we're working on right now and the current state of affairs or state of the art for us is using the taxonomy of deliberate practice. Is there a place where we can read more about this taxonomy? Sure, we've got two new books out. One called Feedback Informed Treatment in Clinical Practice. David Prescott is the lead editor. And uh, the second book is called The Cycle of Excellence. And I am so lucky and have been throughout my career. First there was Stephen Insu, which were very nurturing of uh, my curiosity. Uh, and our joint curiosity. The, in these books, I'm working with, uh, as I said, David Prescott, Sim, uh, Cynthia Mayshalk, uh, Rod Goodyear, Bruce Wampold, Tony Rusmanier. All of these people are, again, uh, just so curious and interested. When you tell them something from the research, their usual response is, huh, can you send me that? Can I read that? Can I see that? That's curious. As opposed to, ah, that's bullshit. I don't believe it. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's very an interesting group to work with. Hmm. So that's that's what I I'd say. And if you have the means, you could always come join us in Chicago. We have trainings in March and in in uh, August as well. Intensive intensive trainings. Okay, great. Maybe my last question is about the future. What do you think? Uh, not what would you like to see, but what do you think? will happen like in 10, 20 years in the area of training? Uh, I mean, what, what, what changes will, will bring maybe something due to your work or the work of uh, your colleagues? In our work? Yeah, 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 in our field. What, what do you think are the, will be maybe the main uh, interesting changes or differences in 15, 20 years from now? You know, I, I honestly, I have no idea. Um, I, I can say that the trends, which may continue, are that the number of training hours is decreasing because it's not possible to really show an advantage of that training, at least in the states where the cost of everything is the foremost concern. So why should we pay somebody with a PhD when we can get a, a, a high school graduate to achieve the same outcomes with some simple support. So I think there's some move in that in that particular uh, uh, direction. Uh, of course, it's intriguing to see how technology is evolving. Uh, I'm curious about that. Uh, I'm not talking about replacing helpful people as more as augmenting uh, and leveraging the reach of those people via technology. It was a major advance when the field said, maybe we could have more than one person in the room. 
that was a major advance. Or is it possible the dynamic therapist, analytic therapist said, yes, we can put them all in a group. Well, now is it possible to have hundreds meet online? That's already happening. So I, I think that's likely to uh, continue uh, as well. And I also think that our models in therapy, sadly, will continue to mirror whatever cultural zeitgeist is popular at the time. So uh, 10 years ago, it was the decade of the brain. We figured out people have brains and now everybody's talking about the brain. Uh, and the decade before that, it was the decade of cognition. So everybody was talking about cognitive oriented approaches. And I'm sure there are going to be uh, more and more comparisons to artificial intelligence and technology in our, in our metaphors about uh, why psychotherapy works. So in terms of what I would like to see happen um, and where our own team is going, I'm really intrigued by natural healers that only really in the last hundred years have been completely displaced in the US. So psychotherapy didn't start with professionals, right? It started with the mind cure people really back in the late 1800s and 1900s. More people see psychics and mediums in the United States. It must, it, I'm, I'm guessing it must be similar in Russia. Absolutely. Then see a therapist. Now we could say they're not qualified or we could say, what the hell are they doing? My my interest and my inclination over my entire life has been, what the hell are they doing? That's what I want to know. But do you think, do you consider that we are part of this tradition, the yes. healing tradition? Yes. But like, like young people, we first have to kill off the father and say, you know, ah, that's a bunch of crap. You know, maybe not, you know, maybe those people are really interesting people. And I'm not saying that there aren't abuses. There are clearly abuses, but so there are in our field as well. <laughs> so um, I'm more interested in, well, what do they do? How do they speak to people? In India, in China, for example, indigenous healers are being tapped by the government to provide mental health care. The reason is sheer e economics and availability. You know, there just aren't enough uh, professionals to do the work. Uh, I think that's an intriguing opportunity, and we have a lot to learn uh, from people who've been doing this longer than us. I, th I think you're doing uh, research about this right now, yeah? We are. Okay, great. We are. We have a, a big survey that's going on in Australia right now, and once it's done and we get the preliminary results, we'll tweak the questions and do repeat it here where we're looking at people who go to see a psychologist is compared to go and see a psychic or a medium or a natural healer. And I have suspicions, but I'm blind to the data right now. So I don't know what we're going to, I don't know what we're going to find. I, I have some thoughts, but. Okay, Scott, thank you very much. I mean, I, I could, you know, go on with my questions forever because uh, it's just, I hope it's uh, as inspiring uh, for our listeners as it, it, it is for me. It's just Me a pleasure, you know, uh, to talk with you. But I think Thanks. we will stop here. Okay. Uh, and thank you very much that you joined us and that you were so kind. Uh, it's my pleasure. And I'm grateful that people would be willing to, uh, to, to listen to these thoughts and ideas. And I, I think in their core, most clinicians are curious people. Uh, and that's what should be sustained in our field. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, man.